In 2019, Call of Duty took one of the biggest steps forward it's ever taken by rebooting its most popular sub-franchise, Modern Warfare. This game looked better than any Call of Duty ever had. It shook up the COD formula while also still managing to feel like Call of Duty. And it also revolutionized the way Call of Duty was monetized by providing all post-launch content for free. Modern Warfare 2019 was such a hit that its free-to-play battle royale mode is one of the most successful battle royales ever and is still very popular to this day. So, in short, Modern Warfare 2019 was a very tough act to follow. A new standard had been set for Call of Duty and there was no going back. Or was there? Enter Black Ops Cold War, the follow-up to Modern Warfare and the fifth entry in the Black Ops series. When this game was announced, there was an insane amount of interest in Call of Duty. With the pandemic requiring people spend most of their time inside, a lot of people picked up gaming as a new hobby. And since the free-to-play Warzone had just released in March of 2020, it was the perfect candidate for the new gamer to download and play with their friends. Black Ops Cold War was announced a few months later, and it was an exciting time. The Black Ops franchise had always Always been very popular and mostly delivered, and since there were a lot of new players in the ecosystem, they were excited to see what was next. But there was something that everyone was forgetting about, and that is the reality of the Call of Duty development cycle. Have you ever wondered how Activision manages to crap out a Call of Duty game once every year, while other franchises like Halo or Battlefield, for example, only release a game once every like four or five years? Well, Call of Duty actually has three main development studios working on three different games at any given time. Those studios being Treyarch, Infinity Ward, and the lesser known Sledgehammer. So for example, in 2013, Infinity Ward released Call of Duty Ghosts. But at that time, Sledgehammer was already working on Advanced Warfare, which would be released the year after that in 2014. And the same goes for Black Ops 3, which was already in early development by Treyarch in order to be released in 2015. This is an important detail because by the time Modern Warfare 2019 had released and was received so well, Black Ops Cold War was already set in its ways. It was already too late to make the game look as good as Modern Warfare, or to implement any of its new mechanics which had become so popular. And on top of this, Black Ops Cold War was already having a rougher than usual development cycle. As it turns out, this game was actually supposed to be made by Sledgehammer. But in 2019, as reported by Kotaku, things were allegedly going so poorly that Activision had to step in and put Treyarch in charge. And that happened only a year before the game was supposed to be released, which, bear in mind, in-game development time is like a day. So Black Ops Cold War was never meant to be a Treyarch game. It was never even meant to be a Black Ops game. But supposedly things were so bad that they had to take what Sledgehammer had already created and slap a Black Ops title on it, just as a last ditch effort to hopefully make the game a success. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we ended up with the empty shell that is Black Ops Cold War. And just like we've done with other Call of Duties on this channel, I want to break this game down. As usual, I've waited until the end of the game's life cycle so that we have the entire picture to look at. And now that it's all said and done, it's time for a definitive review of the game. So grab some popcorn, hit like if you're enjoying the video, and let's talk about the Call of Duty game with the longest and most obnoxious title of the entire series. That's a compound sentence. You got a compound sentence for age, my boy. So, just like I said in my Call of Duty tier list, I tend to rank Call of Duty games based 80% on the multiplayer alone, and the other 20% based on whatever else the game has to offer. Which is usually a campaign and maybe a survival mode. And don't get me wrong, I do like that other stuff, and I even used to be a huge Zombies player, but multiplayer will probably always be my main interest. So before we kick things off by talking about the campaign, I want to talk about something that applies to all three categories, and that is the visuals. The elephant in the room is that no, this game does not look as good as Modern Warfare did. And while that's not necessarily a deal breaker because Modern Warfare is one of the best looking shooters I've ever played, it is disappointing because naturally you'd hope that each Call of Duty game looks better than the last, but Cold War seems like a pretty clear step backward in that department. I do want to say though that I think the colors of Cold War are much better than that of Modern Warfare. If you watched my Modern Warfare deep dive then you know that that's one of my biggest criticisms of that game, and luckily Cold War doesn't make the same mistakes. And the other thing I want to touch on are the reload animations. Now if we could do a quick little sidebar here, before I played Modern Warfare 2019, 
I never really cared about reload animations. In fact, I hardly even noticed them. But that game showed me just how beautiful a reload animation can be, and just how much it can affect your gameplay experience too. They were fluid, visceral, and realistic, more so than any FPS game I've ever played. It made me appreciate the art of reload animations, and now, no matter what game I'm playing, I hold them to a higher standard. So that's why, with this video, I want to kick off a brand new segment for the channel that I have so lovingly named... Welcome for the very first time to the Animation Station where we pick apart and review reload animations. Now you might be thinking, Sitch, I don't care about reload animations. Yes, you do, you just don't know it yet, so shut up and listen. If Cold War came out before Modern Warfare, then I probably wouldn't have a single thing to say about its animations, but alas, it did not. And boy, oh boy, these things are nowhere as good as Modern Warfare's. I was so disappointed to see Call of Duty return to these stiff, lifeless, and boring animations. I mean, let's just look at the MP5 reloads from each game side by side so you can see what I'm talking about. Notice how the Modern Warfare animation seems more aggressive and professional, like the operator knows what they're doing. Like they're in a hurry as they slap that lever. The Cold War animation, on the other hand, feels so artificial, like the gun is being handled by a robot. There's no urgency, and there's no grittiness to it, at least not quite like Modern Warfare. Overall, the Cold War animations give the game a very bouncy feel to it. As another example, just look at this bullfrog reload, as the gun bounces around like the operator's hands are made of noodles. While I don't think these animations are ruining the experience for anyone, they're definitely not doing the game any favors. And that does it for our very first segment of the Animation Station. You're lucky I kept it short this time, because I really could talk about these animations for hours. But I think we'll save that for next year. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's talk about Cold War's campaign. The story of Black Ops Cold War takes place in between Black Ops 1 and Black Ops 2, and immediately this is already a red flag for me. I'm usually not a big fan of prequels, because far too often they screw with the original story. Unless the first story was originally written with a potential prequel in mind, I feel like it's always better to just keep the story moving forward, rather than go back and retroactively add things in. But luckily, this campaign really isn't even a Black Ops story, once you get beneath the surface anyway. So in case you need a refresher of how this story went, here's the executive summary. Oh, and spoilers, by the way. The story follows a group of secret US operatives as they pursue an elusive Russian spy supposedly named Perseus. You play as a new character named Bell, and other members of your team include Mason and Woods from previous Black Ops games, and a new character named Adler who's the leader of the group. The twist at the end of the game is that Bell isn't actually American, but is a Russian who had been brainwashed by the Americans in order to more easily extract information out of him. When Bell finally realizes that he's been brainwashed at the end of the game, the player is given a choice before the last mission. You can either give up the location of Perseus to Adler so that the Americans can stop a nuclear war, or you can lead Adler and his team into a trap where Perseus will ambush and kill all of them and then nuke the world into oblivion. And it is worth noting that if you pick the good ending, you know, the one without the nukes, then Adler actually ends up killing Bell anyway after the war has been stopped, since, after all, Bell used to work very closely with Perseus. It was never personal. So I was saying that I don't like prequels because they tend to mess with the original story. But the thing is that this is hardly a prequel to Black Ops 2, and it's also not really a sequel to Black Ops 1. If anything, it feels more like a branching Black Ops story, like a spin-off. Yes, Alex and Mason are in it, but most of the story revolves around the new characters, Bell and Adler. And I think this is probably the result of the game not being a Black Ops game for most of its development. Like, maybe they already had the basic structure of the story figured out, but once Treyarch stepped in and turned it into a Black Ops game, they reframed some things, added a mission with Mason and Woods, and called it a day. The funny thing is that I actually like this campaign a lot. I just don't like how it's some half-assed Black Ops story. I think the campaign and the game as a whole would have been much better better off if it had been a true reboot of the Black Ops franchise, similar to what Infinity War did with Modern Warfare in 2019. You really could have kept most of the story the same, but just replaced Bell with Mason and Adler with Woods, and boom, you've got yourself a nifty little Black Ops reboot. But with that aspect aside, I really do feel like this was a great Call of Duty campaign. The story had some fun twists and turns, and there was some good mission variety. 
You have the classic run and gun action movie missions along with some stealth missions and a couple of really unique ones thrown in there too. For example, there's this mission where you're sneaking around the Kremlin trying to figure out how you're going to assassinate your commanding officer. Or the last mission, which is just a massive trip as you're going through Bell's consciousness and he's figuring out the truth about his past. There's a seemingly endless amount of branching paths in this mission and there's even a zombies easter egg in there too, which is pretty cool. This is a great Call of Duty campaign and if you're the type of COD player that actually cares about the campaigns, then this is a very compelling reason to like the game. Moving on to Zombies, luckily for all of you, I already made an entire video talking about Black Ops Cold War Zombies, and you can check that out here. But since I do want this video to feel complete, I'll try to summarize my thoughts the best that I can here. To give credit where credit is due, Cold War tried a lot of new things with its zombies mode. There's now a loadout system so you can spawn in with your favorite gun. The story characters have been stripped out of the map so you can run whatever operator you want. And they added in a whole slew of upgrades that actually carry over from game to game, meaning that the more you play, the more powerful you'll get. Long gone are the days of starting the match with no powers and no gun, except for your tried and true 1911 pistol, of course. I know a lot of people love Cold War Zombies. From what I can tell, just by keeping an eye on the Zombies community, it seems like even the hardcore players are generally pleased with it. Unfortunately, that's just not the case for me. Personally, I find Cold War Zombies so excruciatingly boring that I can't even play a full game without losing interest. I always find myself falling asleep somewhere around round 20-ish, and I just want the game to end so I can play something a little more engaging. And you can tell that Treyarch was aware players would feel this way because they added in an exfil feature, which is basically the option to end the match on your own terms without actually being overrun by zombies. And while that's nice to have, I guess, it really just speaks to everything I hate about the design philosophy of Cold War Zombies. The game is just too easy. There's no challenge at all, especially in the early rounds. And this this problem only gets worse as you keep upgrading your abilities. Eventually, you're spawning into the game with godlike power, and there's no way you're going down like that. There's no way you're even gonna have an intense moment for the first 45 minutes of the match. It's just gonna be mindless zombie killing, which I know is actually what a lot of people like about Cold War Zombies. That feeling of immense power and all these crazy fun abilities. I guess I don't blame anyone for liking it, it's just definitely not my style. To be completely honest with you, I'd prefer even the classic zombies from World at War over this one. And that's really saying something, since World at War zombies didn't have many layers to the gameplay. But it got your heart pumping, and that's really the main thing I want from zombies. Those crazy hectic moments where the whole game is hanging by a thread. That feeling of impending doom as you know that the zombies will inevitably grow too strong for you to handle. And that's just not what Cold War Zombies is about. But but if you strip out all the mechanics that are built to make the game so easy a caveman could play it, then I do think the maps are actually pretty decent. I'm glad they brought Perks of Colas back, as that's always been one of my favorite things in Zombies, even though they kind of ruined the system by making the perks extremely overpowered and also allowing you to have as many as you want. The story that they started with Cold War Zombies was a little boring to me and I find it hard to even care about, but I guess some people out there enjoy it, so there's that. Again, I feel like if this game had been a true Black Ops reboot, it would have been a great time to reboot the zombie storyline as well. Bring back the four original characters, simplify the gameplay to be more in line with how it used to be, and then you can build off that for the next few years. From both a gameplay and a story perspective, that would have had me much more interested in Cold War Zombies. They added a new mode for zombies called Outbreak, which I actually do think is a really cool idea. If you never played it, it's basically zombies but on a bigger scale. Bigger maps, more enemy types, more objectives to complete, it's just a bigger and longer experience overall. While the idea is great, it still suffers from that same thing that the traditional Cold War Zombies mode does, which is, it's mind-numbingly easy. Honestly, I don't know how anyone can play this for longer than an hour. Moving on from Zombies, let's finally get into the meat and potatoes, the multiplayer. Now, before we dive in, I want to make one thing clear. I think the Black Ops Cold War multiplayer is good. I know that throughout the game's life cycle, it caught a lot of flack, and I know that a lot of those complaints are completely justified, but it's really not as bad as people make it out to be. For me, I think the one thing that bothered me about it all throughout the year is just that the game felt so empty. And we're gonna talk more about it as we go on, but it just felt like Treyarch was tired, or that they didn't care anymore, or maybe that they just didn't have anything meaningful left to add to Call of Duty. And this was especially hard to swallow right after Modern Warfare 2019, which, in my opinion, was the first COD in a long, long time 
to actually have some passion behind it. That being said though, this isn't a terrible game, and I actually think it's better than most people give it credit for. For example, let's start by talking about what I think is one of Cold War's biggest strengths, and that is the map design. The maps in Black Ops Cold War are unique, colorful, and simple, and at the end of the day, those are probably the most important things to me personally. I mean, just look at the wide variety of settings we have in Cold War. The Pines, which is set in a mall in the 80s, kind of giving off Stranger Things Season 3 vibes. Each store inside the mall has its own theme to it, and when you put it all together, it makes for a really awesome map. Or how about Miami, which shows off the neon-lit streets of a warm Miami night. Or America, which is a Soviet training facility modeled after an American town. Or Deprogram, which actually takes place in the mind of Adler and mashes together certain parts of the campaign and even features a working teleporter. Not only do these maps have unique settings and vibrant colors, but the layouts also make for some very solid gameplay. When it comes to a map's layout, I'm actually pretty easy to please. I like my maps to be small and straightforward. Not too many lanes, not too many windows, and not too much downtime in between fights. The maps in Black Ops Cold War check off all those boxes. I would even go as far as saying that Cold War has the best original maps that we've seen in Call of Duty since Black Ops 3. But there is a problem with the maps in Black Ops Cold War that we absolutely need to address, and that is the overuse of remakes. Let me break down the numbers for you all. Cold War launched with 8 original 6v6 maps, which is already dangerously low. Over 6 seasons of post-launch content, an additional 17 maps were added to the game. Of those 17 maps, Nine were remakes from previous Call of Duty titles. Nine. That's over half of the post-launch maps being recycled. I think it's important for COD to keep pushing out original content so that we can get what will be the classic maps of the future. I don't want to be playing Nuketown and Black Ops 7 20 years from now. I want something new, and at this rate, that won't happen. And look, I actually don't hate it when they bring back these classic maps. I mean, they're classics for a reason, right? They're fun to play. But you do have to draw the line somewhere. These remade maps should be the icing on the cake, not the cake itself. But when Treyarch did decide to make original maps for the game, they turned out great in my opinion. So what about the other aspects of the game? Let's talk about the gunplay, which unfortunately is not very good. The guns in Cold War are pretty lackluster. We've already visited the animation station and talked about how the reload animations are stiff, but also the gun models themselves are boring and even the sounds don't really pack any punch. Shooting a gun in Cold War just isn't as much as a visceral experience as it was in Modern Warfare. But the issues with the guns in Cold War aren't just aesthetic. There are some pretty big functional flaws too. For example, there are a lot of weapons that feel very similar to each other, especially in the assault rifle and SMG category. Which I guess maybe I could understand if there weren't other types of weapons that they could put into the game, but there are. For example, we never saw a low rate of fire, high damage assault rifle in this game. Think something like the Odin from Modern Warfare, which was a unique and fun weapon. We never got anything like that, yet there are 8 assault rifles in the game and half of them just feel like slight variations of each other. Meanwhile, there are only 4 LMGs in this game. Instead of making another assault rifle clone, why not add another LMG or sniper rifle or I, I don't know, just something that's actually interesting. And don't even get me started on the gunsmith in this game. Look, I'm happy they realized how great the gunsmith was in Modern Warfare and they wanted to add it to Black Ops Cold War 2, I really am. But the Modern Warfare version was better in every single way, and what we got in Cold War is kind of a joke in comparison. Here's what I mean. Let's say I'm playing some Modern Warfare, and I love the speed of SMGs, so I'm gonna use an MP5. But also, I'm not the best at controlling recoil, so I want to build the gun to minimize the recoil as much as possible. There are four different attachment slots that can reduce my recoil, giving me more freedom to play how I want. Or let's say that I have my trusty waifu Kilo that I want to use, but I want to build it out to have the fastest possible ADS speed so I can really put some people in the dirt. Well, there are three attachment slots that can boost my ADS speed, and there are also three slots that can slow my ADS speed, meaning that if I'm picking an attachment from any one of these six slots, I'll have to choose carefully so that I can play the way that I want to. 
you. Each decision feels more meaningful, and it can actually be pretty tough to decide sometimes. Now, let's switch over to Cold War and see what the situation's like over there. Let's do the same thing and pull out an MP5 and assume I want to minimize recoil. There are only two attachment slots that can do this for me. That's half what it was in Modern Warfare. And within these slots, the choice is also much easier to make. The agency suppressor is kind of a no-brainer since it suppresses your gun and gives you recoil control. And it's pretty clear the field agent grip is the best grip for recoil control once you look at the stats. But okay, that's just one example. Let's take an XM4 and try to max out ADS speed just like we did with our Kilo. There is only one attachment slot that can boost your ADS speed in Cold War. I'm not making this up, there is only one. So if ADS speed is important to you, then that attachment slot will always be filled with the same thing for you. Overall, the Cold War gunsmith doesn't really make you think as much as the Modern Warfare gunsmith did. And you're also more limited with how finely you can tune your gun to fit your playstyle. That was something that made so many people fall in love with the Modern Warfare gunsmith in the first place. The amount of weird things that you could do with your gun. If you got on one day and wanted to make an LMG act like an SMG, you could do that through the gunsmith. If you wanted to build an SMG that would let you run around the map like the Flash, then you could do that. The possibilities were endless, and it was so much fun to play around with. Now, I guess I can kinda give Cold War a pass here, because I have a feeling they tacked on the gunsmith pretty late in the game's development just to keep up with Modern Warfare. But still, this gunsmith sucks, man. And since we're on the topic of the gunsmith, let's talk about the creative class in Cold War. The good news is that they didn't go back to the old Pick 10 system, which, like we talked about in my Advanced Warfare deep dive, I do not like. They went with a classic slot-based creative class system, thank goodness. They did, however, add an extra layer to the system by letting you pick a wild card for your class that would let you do some pretty cool stuff. For example, one wild card lets you put an extra three attachments on your gun, or another lets you pick an extra perk from each category. To give credit where credit is due, I think these wild cards are pretty awesome. Just like we talked about with the gunsmith, they let you fine tune the way you play, and they're just fun to screw around with too. But it's not all good. The worst thing about the Cold War Creative Class system is the fact that shotguns count as secondary weapons, meaning that you can still have your assault rifle or sniper or whatever, but you can keep a powerful one-shot killing machine in your back pocket at all times. This is a terrible choice for Call of Duty, and I hope that this is the last COD game to ever have shotguns as secondaries. Some Somebody please tell me, what's the point of running an SMG which is supposed to give you an advantage up close if the guy who runs a sniper can pull out a fully automatic shotgun the second you get into close quarters with him? Personally, I feel like shotguns need to be primaries, and if they wanted to add a wild card or a perk that would let you hold two primary weapons, then that's the way to go. The score streak system in Black Ops Cold War is also an abomination, unfortunately. For some inexplicable reason, they decided to take killstreaks, one of the most iconic features in all of Call of Duty, and to make them not killstreaks. In this game, your killstreak progress doesn't reset when you die. Instead, you get points for getting kills, and when you go on a streak, you get a point multiplier. So you still do earn more progress for going on streaks, but if you die, you won't lose your progress. When I first heard about this system, I honestly didn't think too much of it, but after playing a year of Cold War, I can honestly say that it takes all of the fun out of killstreaks. There's no rush of adrenaline when you go on an awesome killstreak. Instead, you're basically guaranteed to get your streaks by the end of the game. And it goes without saying that when everyone is getting their streaks near the end of the game, it makes those last couple minutes a living hell. And the score streaks themselves were also pretty boring. You have a plethora of airstrike type kill streaks like the cruise missile, napalm strike, artillery, and strafe run, which are fine, I guess. And then you also have a plethora of weapon type kill streaks like the flamethrower, war machine, combat bow, and hand cannon, which again are fine, I guess. It really just feels like they took the score streak system and turned it into the specialist system from Black Ops 4, which was basically just there to give every player some powerful item to use at least once per match. And now it's time to talk about my least favorite thing in the Black Ops Cold War multiplayer as a whole, and that is the time to kill. Now, to give you a little context here, before Cold War, I loved the idea of a long time to kill in Call of Duty. That's one of the main reasons I loved Black Ops 4 so much. 
makes gunfights longer and more interesting, and it gives higher skilled players a way to shine. But Cold War, I think, will go down in history as the game that made me lose faith in long time to kill in Call of Duty. The problem with Cold War's TTK is that it doesn't apply to every gun in the game. So a gun like the XM4, for example, feels great, and if everyone were running around with something as balanced as that, then I would love this time to kill. But when you introduce something like a sniper, which can easily kill you in one shot, then it kind of throws the whole game off. Yes, the ADS time for the snipers in Cold War is a bit on the slower side, but they can still ADS and pop you in the chest much faster than you can put them down with something like an XM4. And when that happens to you, it kind of just leaves you feeling like, okay? Why do I have to pump this guy's chest full of lead while all he has to do is click on me once to win the gunfight? And this isn't just a sniper problem. You also have a handful of burst weapons that have one burst kill potential, and even shotguns that can one-shot you. That's right, shotguns, which remember are secondaries in this game, can completely bypass the time to kill and take you down in one shot. What you're left with is a really inconsistent feeling with time to kill. Sometimes you'll get into an honest-to-god gunfight that lasts a bit longer and are more skill-oriented. And these are great, I love this side of Cold War. But then sometimes you'll see someone and just drop dead in an instant, even if you get the jump on them. I know that a longer time to kill generally leads to a higher skill ceiling, which sounds great, but Cold War taught me that it just doesn't mesh very well with Call of Duty, where you have to balance things like shotguns, snipers, and burst weapons into the equation. I think the skill ceiling in COD has always been more about going on those long kill streaks. In a fast time to kill game, sure the average player would be able to get, you know, a couple kills without dying, but only the truly great players would be able to drop those tactical nukes after getting, you know, 25 kills without dying. So, we've covered a lot of things about this game, and we're almost done, but there are a few other miscellaneous things I wanted to talk about before we wrap things up. The movement. I don't like it. Pretty much at all. After falling in love with Modern Warfare's movement, this was like waking up to a bucket of ice water being thrown in my face. They took out bunny hopping, which really gave you a great sense of momentum in Modern Warfare. And instead, in Cold War when you jump, it feels like you're walking around in molasses for the couple seconds after. And another thing that I haven't really seen anyone point out about Cold War's movement that I really don't like is how restricting changing your stance is. You can't stay ADS'd while going prone, which makes it impossible to drop shot. And you also can't stay ADS'd when standing up from being prone. You even have to wait a little bit after getting up before aiming down the sights again, which is just so annoying to me. Slide cancelling is gone in Cold War, which I can understand since it was never supposed to be in Modern Warfare in the first place, but still, I hate to see it go. And another thing that I hate about Cold War's movement that I haven't really heard anyone talk about is Sprint Takeoff. Sprint Takeoff is essentially Cold War's take on tactical sprint from Modern Warfare, or as I like to call it, Super Sprint. This is where you would hit sprint and your operator would kind of take a second to get ready to take off, and then the first couple seconds of sprint would be faster than normal, just like tactical sprint from Modern Warfare. I hate this mechanic because it takes so long to accelerate, and also this stupid animation that plays out looks so flimsy. It starts to feel like your operator is just bouncing around all over the battlefield, and the fact that you take longer to reach full speed just makes you feel so sluggish. Overall, the movement in this game was restricting, and it didn't really give you the chance to style on the enemy, which is one of my favorite things to do. The last thing I want to talk about is the mastery camo from Black Ops Cold War, Dark Matter. The camo itself does look pretty nice, although it's pretty stupid that it only covers like 20% of the gun in some cases. The camo challenges, however, were pretty boring and in some cases outright stupid. For example, trying to get double kills with the Sigma almost made me quit the game as a whole. I mean, this gun was clearly designed by Treyarch to not be able to kill players, so why make this one of the challenges? I think it just goes to show how little thought they put into these camo challenges nowadays. In the future, I'd love to see these feel more unique to each gun, to keep the grind fresh and also to help you experience what each gun has to offer. In conclusion, Black Ops Cold War really isn't a terrible game. It has its shortcomings and it definitely suffered from a lack of vision and passion, but at its heart, it's still a fun Call of Duty experience. And that's one thing that's always confused me about the amount of hate that this game got. Black Ops Cold War plays very similar to how a classic Call of Duty game plays, like Black Ops 2, for example. I'm talking strictly from a gameplay perspective, of course. Yet, for some reason, people mercilessly bashed this game, and they insisted that it's one of the worst Call of Duties ever. Like I've mentioned probably 50 times in this video at this point, 
most of my complaints about Black Ops Cold War come from comparisons with Modern Warfare, because Modern Warfare set a new standard for Call of Duty. But the thing is, I liked Call of Duty even before Modern Warfare, and that's why I enjoyed Black Ops Cold War. It featured a great campaign that told a mind-bending story, even though it wasn't really the Black Ops story that they sold me on. The Zombies mode, while I personally didn't enjoy it, innovated and brought in lots of new Zombies players. And the multiplayer featured some classic Call of Duty gameplay. In terms of weapons and movements, it definitely doesn't live up to Modern Warfare 2019, but it had some of the best Call of Duty maps we've seen in years and still gives you what you'd expect to see from Call of Duty. I think that this will be one of the more forgotten Call of Duty games, just because it didn't really do anything notable and will most likely always be overshadowed by MW19. But just like with most Call of Duty games, I'd bet that as the years go on, players will look back at Cold War and say, you know what, that wasn't half bad. If you made it this far in the video, first of all, you're a legend. And second, comment your favorite Call of Duty below so I know you watched the whole thing. And if you want to watch some other Call of Duty deep dives, I'll leave a link in the comments. Thanks for watching, stay gold.